Recently, an incredible horsemanship symposium was held in the beautiful rolling hills of San Ynez, California, at Intrepid Farms, a well-known Morgan horse ranch hosted by Arthur Perry, where a little magic took place one weekend, and the concept of a birth to maturity program known as Light Hands Horsemanship was presented and demonstrated for an enthusiastic crowd of long-term horse owners. Sponsored by Spalding Labs, the event brought the most widely respected horsemen together to share their insight and knowledge for the benefit of improving people's riding, communication, and relationship skills with their horses. One of the things that they all have in common and will stress in their presentations is the use and development of lightness. Lightness is their cornerstone. It is what all clinicians strive for. From their first touch through advanced training, you will see lightness from the handheld touch of a lead line to the hand and rein communication of the advanced horse and rider. Masters of subtlety, soft hands, and quiet methods of Western, English, and classical horsemanship, they will demonstrate on elegant horses how to achieve complete respect and compliance without producing fear in the horse. This event will inspire you and help you to achieve oneness with the horse. We're going to get started here. We're, we're determined again today to keep this on schedule, so I would like to introduce to you Dr. Robert M. Miller. I want to talk about what a remarkable animal the horse is. The horse is the most unique mammal in the world. What other animal could you take in a wild state that grown up wild, never seen or touched by a human being, and bring it into captivity. And in a matter of a few hours, if you understand how to communicate with that animal, have it bonded to you, trusting you, gentle, where you can handle it all over its body, get on its back and ride it in just a few hours. There's not another creature in the world. So the horse, they, you know, we, we talk about Dogs being man's best friend, well, surely the horse has been man's, mankind's best uh, servant. So, the whole point is this. If you can start a wild horse in a matter of hours and make them gentle and safe to ride, why do we have to use coercive and forceful methods, brutal methods very frequently, with domestic horses that have been raised in captivity? It just doesn't make sense, does it? And that's why we're here. That the concept of lightness is because lightness is, is all you need is light signals. You don't have to be severe to get a reaction from a horse. I'm going to very quickly go through 10 qualities of horse behavior that are unique to the horse. Number one is this is a flight animal. It's primary survival uh, behavior is flight, and that's not true of all prey animals, because most prey species are equipped with weapons, horns or tusks, uh, that ha they can defend themselves. Uh, how many of you saw the recent, very recent National Geographic of the uh, herd of Cape Buffalo attacking a pride of lions and tossing the lion clear up in the air, and those lions cowering in fear? See that? Debbie and I have seen a half-grown hippopotamus charge a lion and send it running. It just opened its mouth and bellowed and charged the lion. So most, uh, prey animals are not necessarily helpless, but the horse is one of the few prey animals that, whose primary survival behavior is flight. Now, the next nine things all go back to that, that it's a flight creature. Number two, that it's the most perceptive of species because they hear things, smell things, see things, and feel things that we are not aware of. Number three, it has the fastest reaction time of any domestic animal. And you saw that with that bullfighting horse. Here's, here's one prey species, the bovine, attacking another prey species, but see how much faster the reaction time of the horse is that he can evade uh, the bull because the bull's weapons are its horns. That's its, that's its defense, and the horse's, the horse's defense is its ability to...
Number four, the, one of the best memories in the entire animal kingdom because horses are the poor memory in a flight species, they get killed. They don't live to reproduce. So horses have a, a fantastic memory, and they categorize everything they memorize into two categories. Things to run from, things I don't have to run from. I don't have to run from somebody in my back. I don't have to run from the bull. I have to run from an electric clippers, <laughs> or a trailer, or a veterinarian. <laughs> Number five, fastest learner. The fastest learner in the animal kingdom. Because if you're a flight animal, if you don't learn fast, you don't survive to reproduce. So it's natural selection. Horses learn both good and bad very, very fast. That's the reason. That's the reason that this species can be handled where it's never seen a human being in a matter of hours. Be trusting and gentle and, uh, and bonded to a human being. It's because of the speed of learning. Number six, the most easily desensitized of all domestic species to frightening stimuli. Why? Because a flight animal, if it didn't quickly figure out something that terrified it and find out, well, it, it scared me, but it's harmless, like an umbrella or blanket or a saddle or an electric clippers, if it didn't quickly figure out that it's, it's not going to hurt it, it would be running all the time. There'd never be the time to eat or drink or rest or reproduce. So flight creatures must desensitize quickly if we know how. We have to know how to do it. Horses can be desensitized to any stimulus, no matter how severe the stimulus is, providing it doesn't cause pain. Providing it doesn't cause pain. And we're humans. Get in trouble with horses is many of the things we do with them cause pain. And that puts the desire to run away in the horse's mind, to get away from the source of pain. Number seven, this is a herd creature. Most domestic animals are, and so are we. Some animals are loners, bears. Domestic, most cats, not all, but most cats are, uh, live and hunt alone. Uh, but uh, human beings and dogs and goats and horses uh, and sheep and cattle live in groups in the wild, in the primitive state, they live in groups. And animals that live in groups, uh, there's several characteristics about them. One of those characteristics is that if they don't have their own kind, they will accept a substitute, and it's called a surrogate, surrogate bonding. That's why we are so attached to our pets, where they become part of our family, and conversely, to the, to the dog, we are part of the pack. And the horses are the same way. Horses prefer horses, but if they don't have horses, they'll accept bonding with any other creature, including a chicken. And of course, including human beings. So that surrogate bonding is a very important thing in domestication. Number eight, each species has a body language of its own. We, uh, all mammals communicate in two ways, vocally and with body language. Now, as a species, we primarily communicate vocally. We talk. Not completely. We still use body language. A horse is the other way around. It primarily communicates with body language because it's dangerous to make noise if you live in the wild surrounded by predatory species that are, want to eat you. So horses are fairly quiet species uh, in nature, and they communicate primarily with body language. We have to learn the body language of the horse. They, can le they learn ours, but we're supposedly more intelligent, so it makes more sense for us to learn the body language of the horse. And that learning the body language of the horse is the secret of this revolution in horsemanship. Number nine. Animals that live in groups have a hierarchy with the alpha, the natural leader at the top, and the subordinates down to the most submissive individual at the bottom. And this hierarchy in the horse, and only in the horse, not in dogs, not in goats, not in sheep, not in people, is 
is determined by control of the feet, control of movement. It's the secret of this revolution in horsemanship. And it's always been the secret of good horsemanship, but it hasn't been put together and understood. That's the control of movement is control of the horse's mind. And you control movement two ways, and you're going to be seeing this this weekend. One is to inhibit movement. The horse wants to move, but it's inhibited. That's one reason the round pen is so useful. The horse quickly figures out. It can't go where it wants to go in a straight line for a quarter mile away from us. And that, so that, that creates submission. The second way we control movement is by causing movement. Like Monty's round pin. The, the join up. Causing movement. Causing movement. The horse goes its flat distance and then it's still chasing it. That line is still chasing it. So the next thing it does is it looks for help. Anybody around. I need help. I need help. And that's the join up. And this uh, outfitter here from Bishop that you just saw, Dave Donnell, he's combined two techniques that he learned from two people. He's combined the Jeffrey method, which he learned from an Australian, Maurice Wright, and the join-up method from uh, Monty Roberts. And he combined those two methods into his starting his Mustangs. It takes him three hours to take an adopted Mustang and make it rideable. Not, not finished. <laughs> but at least started. And finally, number 10, this is a precocial species, which means when it's born, it's not helpless like a human baby or a puppy or a kitten or a bear cub or a, or a newly hatched eagle or owl. It's neurologically mature, all of its senses working, and most important, its learning capacity is at the highest peak of its entire lifetime right after it's born. And we're going to be talking about that tomorrow morning. The whole emphasis this weekend is light hands. It all starts right here, okay? It starts the minute that this halter, the minute you walk into that stall or that, that pen to get him caught, it starts. <clears throat> if a person walks in real abruptly and gets your horse stirred up right away, that's how your, your session's going to be. I don't like to call this a, a training session. Horses can't stand horse trainers. They don't like to be trained on. And what I mean by that is being nitpicked. I see a lot of people just pick and pick and pick at a horse. They always take and never give back. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to set some ideas up for this little guy and let him just kind of figure it out. Now you're going to see me move around in my pen an awful lot. I might get something started on him really good or just get a start on something and you might see me move 10 feet. He has a one track mind and only thinks of what's being done at that time. Okay, So I might start over here and I'll, you'll see me move around in here a lot. Um, and I'll explain that as I go. <clears throat> to start with, I'm just gonna move back and forth here and see if he can just follow me a little bit. Okay, I might move to the left over here and I want him to follow. If he doesn't follow, I might give him just a slight bump with my lead rope. I don't have to jerk him or give him a hard tug, but maybe just, a, just something slight to get his attention. But if he can just follow me right in here, there's no reason for me to put him on the outside of my round pen and run him around. I, I see a lot of people do that. I hear a lot of stories. Well, that son of a gun, I put him in my round pen and my brother and I run him around for two or three hours and then we got my wife out there and run him around we never did get him to hook on. Well, that horse gave and gave and gave, and they never saw it coming. And they, they totally, uh, basically defied the horse, in my opinion. Um, that horse gave to them, and they just kept asking and asking and asking. So I think it's something that, that a lot of people miss, and it's body language <clears throat> that they're not seeing, okay? So I just want to be here to support my horse. That's really all I'm trying to do. If he wants to look over there, I might walk over here and give him a slight tug. Pretty soon that attention is gonna be all onto me. I want him to look at me and focus on me with both eyes, not just one. I'm gonna approach and retreat. He's accepting that pretty nice. Can I stop? Can I flag him from out in front? That was pretty good. Now if you're gonna try the flag at home, don't get it down around his shoulders or underneath his neck to start with. 
okay? They're very protective of those areas and they can strike. And they may strike you, it's not on purpose, it just so happens that you have a hold of this flag, okay? It's only three feet. And you can see a little bit of concern in there. And that's fine, it should, there should be some concern. He doesn't know if this thing's lined with a bunch of teeth on the end of it or what it is. And even here I'll back up as I wave this around a little bit. My ideal goal with this eventually be to ride him with it and be able to wave it on him while I'm riding him. Much movement over here bothers him. That's fine if it bothers him. That's what I'm going to do. I'll just have more movement. I'll cause more. A lot of people would say, oh, my horse is bothered with that, so we probably shouldn't go there. I had some people today say, well, we didn't put the umbrellas up yesterday because we didn't know how your colt would react. Well, if you notice, they're up today. Because that doesn't bother me. My horse would need to get used to that. a little better. I'll just move him and start over again. You can see there's times when the mouth will quit and there's times when the mouth will work again. That's okay. See if he can drag this with those hind legs again. That's a good, good blow right there. The nose drops down. When his head drops down, his throat gets soft. But you can see, five minutes ago, he wanted to jump and kick at this when it went up, went up over his back and under him. And now he can drag it with both those hind legs back there. Okay. And he's moving forward. His nose is in and down. He definitely knows where this bag is at. And I'm not going to say that he's convinced this is a great deal. But he can tolerate it right now. And that's, I have to start with that before I can start with anything else. Okay. Now you can see I have my saddle rest on my hip. My right arm goes right across the seat of my saddle and I got a hold of the cannel. Okay, with my right hand. Right there. I'm going to reach down with my left hand. And I'm just going to grab the front skirt of my saddle, right there. And all I'm going to do is rotate my hip and just set that on there, okay? The minute that that touches his back, my hands are all over him, okay? There's that support coming in, okay? I'm going to pull my saddle pad up in the gold of my saddle, and I might even take and move that saddle back a little bit as I go, rock that back and forth, and then support him. I'm right there to support him. When I put my saddle away, I'll show you how I do all this, but I have a knot tied in my latigo just to keep everything nice and neat. And I'm going to just pull that knot out right there. And I'm going to go to the other side. Okay. And I want to get organized. That's the number one key when you're saddling or unsaddling is just being organized. Okay, and I'm going to just check my cinch. I got latigos on both sides of all my saddles because I ride such a variety of sizes. I can adjust them a lot easier. That looks like it's going to work for me. Okay. Now I'm standing at my horse's shoulder. Okay. And I'm standing with my knees facing his rump. There's a reason for that. When I slide my hand down there and pick up that cinch, if he gets bothered and jump past me and kicks, my legs will only bend one way. Okay? Now I'm hoping that I've got him prepared where that won't happen, but that's life. Sometimes those things happen. Sometimes it happens on an older broke horse. Okay? So I'm going to take my, the back of my hand, okay, and I'm going to rub it right down 
that girth area a time or two. And I don't know if you guys can see that, but his hide twitched right there a little bit. So it would have been too much for me if I just reached down there and grabbed onto that. Okay, so I'm going to rub here. I'm going to slide down nice and easy, and I'm going to replace my cinch with my arm. I take the tail of my latigo through my cinch ring, and I pull it, and it all comes undone. Okay. Now, I'm not going to bang my cinch on his belly off and on. I try to keep a somewhat of a constant pressure on there, and I'm going to try to get three wraps with this latigo. Okay. And I'm going to slowly tighten it up right there. If he has to move, I'm fine with that right now. Okay, I'm going to put my forearm against him. And as I pull on my latigo, I'm going to push against him just a little bit right there. Okay, if I stand out off to his side and pull on this latigo, I'm going to pull him off of balance. And that can scare him. He might really get troubled there. Now notice when I get on, how he'll tip his head to the right just a little bit. He's just counterbalancing my weight. That's all he's doing, he's using his head for balance. If I put weight on his left side, he's going to tip that nose to the right side a little bit. Okay? So if I get on him and I bend him to the left, and I get on from the left, I'm going to pull him off of balance and he's going to have to walk off. Okay? So that's why I keep his head fairly straight right there. I know that kind of goes against a lot of what some people are teaching, but that's just kind of what works for me. And, and like you've seen the lot yesterday and the rest of today, there's more than one way. There's a lot of different ways to get done what we're trying to get done. There, see him tip that head to the right, right there. Reach back here and grab that pine. So that was a little bit quick. I probably shouldn't have, shouldn't have moved that quick on him, but I did. But I'm human. I make those mistakes. Right here, he swelled up like a water balloon. So I'm just going to rub on him right here. Let him know that everything's going to be okay. My hands are going to be all over him. Because they have been the last day. Yesterday and, and today my hands have been all over. Now for his first step, it isn't going to be forward. If I can help it. I may not have any control over that. But for his first step, might be a little bit of bend right there. We'll check out his bend again. There's his first step. Right there. Whether you want to think that's a step or not, that was his first ride. And as far as I'm concerned, I could get off of him right now and I'd feel happy. And I know he would too. And this is where I'm not going to get greedy with him. This is where the human's going to get greedy. Right here. We're always going to want more, okay? There's some bend. My leg is just coming in. There. There's a second step, okay? I don't care where it went. He moved his feet. So it matters. I'm not going to do anything any different on him right now. There's a lot of bend. And I'm not holding them. He wants me out of here. I'm trying to chew my clothes off. We'll get that bend to the left. I'm starting to apply my calf right now. I'm just going to wait. And I don't worry about that too much. There. There's my step right there. Okay. So I'm going to need to take my lead rope. We'll flip it over to the other side. So I may just check this out right here. My left ring is short. It's not tight, but it's a little bit shorter. And if that bothers him, I wouldn't want to have that lead rope stuck way out there and have him jump ahead. So he needs to get used to having this go 
something over right there. Okay? He thinks he'll go right back to that. That worked for him for a minute there. Right there, we'll see if we can move the hinds. He wants to bend to the left so much. Can we just move our hinds? I'm just tapping with that leg until I get that. Right there. That's good. <coughs> Hi, we're having a great time we're here today. We're having a great time. We came last year and we learned a lot last year and we learned more this year. Absolutely. It's a great show. Everybody needs to come. Uh, we're just all having such a fantastic time here. The intimacy of the event has just been amazing and the clinicians are just fantastic. Just to be able to talk to all these guys on a one-on-one -on -one basis has just been the absolute top. I don't know what else to say really. <laughs> I am having the best time. The last demonstration that we saw meant so much to me. I'm going to go home and try those things myself. Between sessions, guests could enjoy the many vendors who came to support the symposium and offer exceptional quality equipment and merchandise. Everything from videos, books and learning materials, to saddles, vaquero gear, equine accessories, custom-made boots, bronze sculptures, handmade jewelry, video and TV production services, and just about anything for the horse and rider were available. It's, it's been amazing, it's been a revelation in horsemanship. Really, really enjoyed it. To feed the hungry guests, a chuck wagon crew came all the way from New Mexico to provide some of the finest meals this side of the Continental Divide. At the end of a long day, guests were treated to some excellent entertainment. Amarillo's where I'll be From a foam boot in Cheyenne I made a promise to Diane No more rodeos, I made the last go round Next up is Lester Buckley. Let me tell you just a little bit about him. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Equine Science from Sol Ross University in Texas. He spent seven years as an assistant trainer to NCHA Hall of Fame and World Open champion Willie Richardson. He's been a trainer for the King Ranch, the largest ranch in the world. He's been a trainer for the Parker Ranch in Hawaii. He's been the horse herd foreman for Parker Ranch, responsible for breeding and training of all ranch horses. He's an American Paint Horse Association Top 10 Honor Roll 
in a cutting, senior cutting, and APHA Super Stakes Reserve Champion in cutting, NCHA 3000 Novice Horse Champion, BCCHA 10,000 Novice Horse Champion. He holds a Hawaii Hope Open Cutting Champion and Futurity Champion of Cow Horse Championships. And he is internationally licensed in dressage and sport jumping by Federation, Federation Nationale. He is the only Western trainer to also receive his international trainer's license, bronze and silver performance medals in dressage and sport jumping for the German Federation Nationale. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lester Buckley. Now right there is key. You heard that sound towards the end of John's ride or his uh, groundwork. And to me that is one of the most important things about mental and physical suppleness is that blowing. In order for a horse to blow right there, they've got to be relaxed. In order to be relaxed physically, they have to be relaxed mentally. In order to be relaxed mentally, they've got to turn loose of especially the tension in their mind and for a deep exhalation which he just gave me they've got to really squeeze those last 10 breathing ribs we're going to talk a lot about confirmation in the body of the horse and how it relates to our kind of riding and uh, that'll kind of be my main focus I'm not going to talk a lot about my particular style of riding or go in depth about my aids uh, the main thing for me is that you have a good independent seat and Annie's going to come along after me and tell you what's key for her to have an independent seat. The main things for me is I kind of have an open door policy when I ride horses that if something scares them, I never close the door on them. I open the door and I show them where I want them to go. Our nature is that if something startles a horse, our nature is to go, <gasps> and grab a hold of them and I have found that that's usually the last thing a horse needs is when they're already starting to feel a little bit claustrophobic and they tighten up and raise their head is for me to get a hold of the reins and, and grip with my legs so I have to teach myself to kind of overcome my tendencies of grabbing hold when the horse tenses up and so he's probably gonna jump snort a couple of times today and when he does uh, if I'm loyal to what I believe, I'll breathe out, relax, show him where I want him to go by offering him an open door. Uh, so that's real key to me. 90% of my riding, whether it's show horses or dressage horses jumping or cutters is in a snaffle bed. And it's not because I believe the snaffle is the main bit that we should be using, because uh, it's not. But a lot of my horses are gonna go to other people when I'm done with them. And the reason I ride them in a snaffle is because if I've got them 100% right on the money in a snaffle, I can have it in any bit. But if I need something with a little bit more leverage to kind of have everything working just right for me, I really hadn't addressed it uh, all the way back to a one-to-one -one ratio. So a snaffle bit to me has, I pull one pound on the left rein, he feels one pound of pressure on his left bar, a little bit of supporting pressure on the right cheek. So that's why I like to have my customers especially use a snaffle because if they don't have an independent seat and they accidentally hold on to the bit, this is only one pound of pressure for one pound of pull. Good. That's key right there. And notice too, when he breathes out with those back 10 breathing ribs, that you'll also a lot of times see his head come down. So I have a training scale in my mind. I have a scale for the rider and a scale for the horse. And the second thing on the scale of the horse is mental and physical relaxation or suppleness. I can't go any higher in my training if I ever lose mental and physical relaxation. The only thing that comes before that to me is rhythm. So I need to know what all the natural gates of this horses are like. And there's a sweet spot in each one of those gates, walk, trot, canter, that it feels just right. And that's kind of that horse's natural rhythm. And as he and I get to know each other, I can influence those. I can collect them. I can speed them up. I can 
hold that uh, weight bearing moment of the gate a little bit and increase that suspension and air time just for a moment. But it's important that I don't hold them when they're trying to propel themselves forward. I just want to hold whichever leg is just starting to carry a little bit of weight, especially on the hindquarters. So I've got rhythm, mental and physical relaxation or suppleness. After that, and this is even with the classical horses, then we start to work on our contact. But I can never work on my contact if I got a rhythm fault or a mental and physical relaxation fault. If I haven't undermined uh, anything, I can continue to go on and work my way up my pyramid. After I've established all the rhythm I want and all the different gates, I know what it is and I can influence it up, down, collect it. I've established the mental and physical suppleness. He's breathing, he's blowing, he's not worried. His ears are kind of swinging around, checking out the environment around us. His tail's rhythmically moving from left to right. It's not camped to the right, camped to the left. He's not hollow-backed, but he's not roach-backed either. A lot of times you'll see these youngsters, when you get on them, they'll put their head down to try to carry our weight. We'll get into the muscles of the horse here in a little bit, and then you'll understand why a lot of them do that. Um, we look at the horse and we think, well, they're designed to carry weight. Their skeleton is designed to carry weight, but the muscles I'm sitting on are actually designed for propulsion. And then we'll understand how to develop a horse with proper riding key right there key again. So you need to have that every single day during your warm-up. So as I start to tip him up into a trot, I'm going to really reward that left hind leg for stepping up. I'm going to try to keep a little bit of bend with my left leg. He has a tendency to kind of want to look off to the left and that's okay. But with my weight and driving aids, I'll try to keep him on the line that I'm riding and I probably won't have to use a lot of rain aids. I might have to use a little bit of direct rain here to kind of get him to uh, give me a little bend. And then when he's pretty straight, I might drive him forward, get a little bit of contact, hold it, and as he reaches for the contact and offers me some mental relaxation there, then I'll relax it and give it back to him. But I don't want to use my reins in such a way that I suppress the stretching of the neck. If I can get him to stretch down towards the bit, then I'll slowly let him have those reins back, but I'd like to not see a big difference in his tempo and a lot of big difference in his cadence. Assuming there's a hole under that. So if I'm gonna collect him for a little bit, I'm just gonna drive him towards my bridle. I'll start to get my hands where I would eventually want them if I were gonna ride him in a class, and that's the sweet spot right there. Once he hits that little sweet spot that I want, I don't do anything. He gets a little micro reward from my hands. And then I'll slowly let him take that bit down and forward there and stretch that neck out. If he's not stretching towards the bit, the best thing I can do is try to drive him, encourage him to reach with his hind legs. There, right there, you saw his head go forward about an inch. Now he's starting to stretch his back stretch those neck muscles. So then when I drive him towards contact, then I'm more likely to have him wanting contact rather than me trying to pull him into some man-made false contact. And a lot of that's just taking the time to keep him natural in his paces. He kind of looks off to the right over here. So right before he looks off to the right, I'll try to get his attention with my inside leg. Same thing here, I'll hold a soft feel, but I'd like to drive him till he reaches towards that bridle. Just get him to where he's not afraid of contact and actually stretching a little bit more in the front. Why am I doing this? Because I want him to want to be guided and I want him to want to be showed the way with the bridle. But if every time I go for the bridle, he just gets behind it then I don't really have a very good relationship with my hands. Whereas if I can take a hold of him and drive him into the bridle, then when my weight and driving aids stop, then I can stop him a little bit more square.
Children's Celebrated Horse, Sunshine Superman, owned by Louise Spur and trained by Rob Wallen. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ann Go. Well, I heard John this morning say, first impressions, everything. So I went and I found the biggest saddlebred I could ever find. And I've been working with saddlebreds and Morgans, I'm not gonna tell you how many years, but he's the biggest. And um, what we have here, also to keep the impression good, thought about bikinis for the girls, but I'm surrounding myself with two beautiful redheads, so I'm looking better all the time, aren't I? Uh, I am so honored to be here as a guest clinician, and I'm very, very fond and, and honored to have this guy, which I just met early the week, this week. His bar name's Donovan. His owner, Louise Curran, is here, and the wife of the trainer. And you know what uh, Dr. Miller said this morning about the wife being the, the smart one? She's here. And they brought him all the way up from Temecula. He is a, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about him, but he is 16 years old. He's not a baby by any means. So when you clapped, I was surprised that he didn't just say, for me, great. What I thought would be kind of fun today, uh, Rick asked me yesterday in an interview, why do you choose saddle seat? Well, I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and that was pretty much the choice to ride in. I didn't give that answer. I'd like to do it again, Rick. But <clears throat> the other thing is, after I watched John heaving that 40, I think he said seven pound saddle around, that's another reason, because this weighs less than 10 pounds, okay? But there are drawbacks um, in riding saddle seat first, but in the long run, probably the least helpful saddle made because there's not a lot here. When I get off in just a second, I just rode in so you know I really can get on a horse and ride. Um, I'm, uh, the girls are gonna be my guinea pigs today. And um, we're gonna talk about an independent seat. Now I first said balanced, that's kind of where I came from. And by balanced, <clears throat> I mean that everything's in line. So we came up with independent because I was talking to Debbie and Aid about it. And Debbie thought I meant your natural balance. You know, when your horse zigs, you want to go with him and that kind of thing. Most of you are born with that. And there are a few things we'll talk about tomorrow, a few exercises for those of you who like to ride that um, you might help sharpen your balance. Sadly, it goes with age. Why don't I know? And so anything you can do to keep your balance, that's the zigzag thing staying in the middle of your horse, that's uh, going to help you be an effective rider. But I've got here, if you've got your little handouts, you can see the three different seats. And there's a great similarity to the three different seats. Um, this has probably the longest stirrup, but she doesn't have to post, uh, in the show ring anyway. Uh, and usually you don't pick a big bouncy trotting horse to ride with a western saddle. <laughs> there's Donovan, because we're going to do that tomorrow again. Then um, the saddle seat saddle, which is a bit more of an angle, so I can post, but my leg under me, an excuse, I have a few saddlebred friends here. I didn't wear jod first because I wasn't thinking about riding. But the girls are properly tired in saddle seat work equipment. And then we have the hunt seat saddle. And a stirrup is a, yet a bit shorter, but each one of them is for a different purpose. So I'm going to, uh, let the girls dismount from their horses and maybe the guys could help get the saddles out so the girls can help me make a change here. I need a parachute coming down. Hello. What Danny's going to do is all of us have problems as riders and we've watched this wonderful day. I'm gonna take that. Thank you. Get your reins. You need help. This is new. This is a running martingale and a snaffle bit. It's a little smooth snaffle. Great big horse for a little bitty smooth snaffle. And we're going to have Danny just walk. Get your reins up shorter. You're almost going to hear a riding lesson a little bit today, but what we're going to talk about this independent seat thing, the balance or uh, the line. If you look at your, your drawings, you're going to see a line right from through the ear 
through the shoulder, through the seat, to the back of the heel. Now, I took Danny's spurs. I have spurs right now. And I also carried a whip. And we'll talk about this in a minute. But I took Danny's spurs off because if you'll notice, <coughs> her leg on this horse is right on the widest part, her heel, sorry, it's right on his wa the widest part of his girth line. And she is using her leg, but she doesn't always mean to use that heel because she hasn't really worked on getting that lower leg strong because she doesn't have to post a lot. And so some of the faults that came with Danny, and she's being nice to share this <laughs> with us, is a terribly, terribly arched back. So you are very straight. And you notice when we don't have to do anything but walk, she's got beautiful posture on the horse. Um, once we start trotting, we're going to sort of see things come undone. Uh, what, when we, we're going to talk about all the positions, but let me go back and talk about this independent seat. What we're trying to accomplish here is to have everything so balanced that when someone tells you, use your right leg, use your right hand, raise your hands, lower your hands, soften your hands, take hold of your reins, that your body is independent and you don't have to rely on those reins to hold on. You don't have to wrap your legs around, you know, the old bareback riding, rip those legs around, because we want legs on, we want legs off. We might want one on and one off. If that's how you're holding on, you're in trouble. That's what I'm talking about, trying to create an independent seat. Um, like I said, walking, she's pretty, pretty solid. Now, the next thing is equitation. I, I take some exception with some of this, so I'm going to just step right up and tell you. I am a horse woman first. I love to teach. I want my riders to be effective equitation riders. I want to be an effective equitation rider. And I'm going to use Amber in a little while to show you what not to do. That does not mean that somehow some instructor has drilled it into you that you pose in some horribly awkward position. And while your horse is running off, you still have that big smile on your face thinking that you're being effective because you're not. I love the term workmanlike. We want to make the position balanced and workmanlike so that everything can work independently when we need it to. This particular saddle, as you see, has very little help. There's no knee roll. It's very flat. Um, it is developed for, I guess that's the other thing I'm here for, the high-headed breed representative. Now, I know most of the audience Never seen anything like this horse. But you can see where her hands are, and he's built this way. He, we're going to try to ride him on seed and western, but for the breed, this is what they breed for, the high-headedness and the alertness this horse has. So we're not going to get his head way down because of the way he's made. Uh, but she's got to be able to put her hands way up. She's got to be able to put her hands way down, request, whatever that horse requires. So when your trainer tells you or your horse tells you this is what you need to do, hopefully you figure it out without having to be told, then you'll be able to do it. Okay, that's what we're going to work towards today. And hopefully um, he'll be a good boy. He's being wonderful. He is a show horse. He's not a lesson horse, and I would normally use a lesson horse for this. What we want to develop are our five aids, and I guess we could get into question and answer, not question and answer, but just poll the audience. There are five aids, and um, if, you, if you know any of them, I'm going to ask for one aid. Somebody yell it out. Legs are definitely a great aid. So we've got one down. Anybody else? Seat, that's number two. What? Back? Back? Uh, we're going to move it down a little. Seat, because it's your weight. Okay, your back can cause some problems if you don't have it in the correct position, but your weight's going to... Your seat's going to really, so we'll move to seat. That was close. So we got three. What's, reins? No, that's, that's not an aid. That's a, how about hands? <laughs> There's always one in every crowd. Um, how about hands? Did we talk about hands? So we've got legs, seat, hands. What else? Somebody, 
voice. Thank you very much, and that's my favorite. I know there's some disciplines that don't. I know that comes as a surprise to my friends. Uh, I know that a lot of disciplines don't let you speak in the ring, which would I probably explode. But all my horses, um, and here we're talking about cues and training, but just for instance, I can say canter, and they'll canter. They may not get set up for the lead properly, but for a bad rider, you might be able to help them through by just saying canter. Um, I also have signals for whoa, walk, uh, trot, th different, different, but everybody has something different. We're going to talk about those things, but we're still missing one. Anybody know what the other one is? Oh, who said it? Your brain. Thank you. Um, you know what? I could tell you all these aids, and I am learning to ride Western with Aton and what little Harry has left. Um, it, it, it's driving him nuts because I've been doing this. Uh, he's been doing this for years, and uh, I have to know what what he wants me to do to get that horse to do what he's trained it to do, and that's something these guys are kind of talking about. But I want you to be able to use these aids independently. Um, so to develop that, we're going to ask uh, Danny here to shorten her range just a little bit and go just a nice slow trot and do, uh, we're going to do a rising trot as, as he called it. And you're going to see one of our problems. Now remember that beautiful line we had? We had the shoulder, we had the heel, and the seat all in one line. Can you see that her feet have gotten forward? And then we're going to work real hard on getting her back flat. She's suddenly gotten very sway back. She has back problems. So we, we want to work on that. We've got an open knee. She's using more, more calf than she is anything else than thigh and knee. So I want her knee in. I want her heel off because she had a spur on. She'd be gigging him every step. So she's going to work on that a little bit, try to flatten. But every time she gets straight, she kind of loses her balance. Good girl, sweetie. That's a good try and walk. She's working very hard, so you guys got to appreciate this. This is very difficult for her. Is Jill here? Does Jill Smith here and have her chair handy? Can you? Ladies and gentlemen, Aton Bethelachmi is a fifth generation Israeli. Some of his earliest exposure to horses came as a young boy in an agricultural school where he volunteered to take horses take care of the horses and mules that were used for working the school's fields. His love of horses turned to an obsession. Always a student, his desire to know more was a driving force. His early education and foundation came from a circus trainer and a retired cavalry officer. And because of the movies with their silver screen cowboys such as Glenn Ford, Audie Murphy, and Roy Rogers, his passion for the American cowboy grew from a childhood obsession to an adult dedication. After his military service as an Israeli paratrooper, he attended the University of Vienna, where he studied veterinary medicine for two years. During that time, he cleaned stalls at the Spanish Riding School of Vienna. Being a keen observer, the seed was planted. It was the call of the American West as portrayed by the Hollywood Cowboy, the horses and its code and lifestyle that brought Aton to the United States. Here he continued his education at UC Davis in California. He also began his career as a dedicated horse. He has trained and ridden many of the breeds popular here in the U.S. His love and appreciation for all breeds is strong, but it is his special love of the Morgan horse that fills his life today. Aton has won many world and national titles, setting new standards and raising the bar in his field of competition. After his honorary performance representing the United States in the closing ceremony at the World Equestrian Games in Aachen, Germany in 2006, with his beloved Morgan Stallion Santa Fe Renegade, who was here with him this weekend, Aton remarked, I have truly lived my dream. It was all leading to this moment. Aton has since retired from public training, and his retirement is dedicated to education. His love and dedication to the horse and his talents as an artist have led him on an equine journey that today he now calls Cowboy Dressage, a combination of his early learning and his childhood dreams. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Eitan Beth Halakmi.
you. You understand the concept of that you can do whatever you want to do as long as you have fun doing it, okay? A, I, I think for 67 years I waited to the day that I can say, ha, I can do anything I want to do. I don't need to go to the show ring if I don't want to. I can pick up the wrong lead. You know how many years I was dreaming about picking up the right lead? Matter of fact, when I was 18, I didn't know there are two leads. If I pick up the canner and go, that was good enough for me. And then I start learning things. And more I learn, more I got depressed. That's not easy to know a lot. And especially if you need to maintain that. You know, it's constant kind of a work to feed yourself up with a new information. Here I got a horse here that he and I, I have no doubt, no, no, no doubt, have a, some kind of a relationship. And we talked about it last night. And I say, I don't think the relationship is a relationship of love, but it's respect, it's partnership. I love that horse in a different way that I love something else. But he knows me and I know him. And when we're doing something together, I can feel that I'm bond. I'm one piece. I am just glued to that horse. And that's true. Sometimes I need to raise my hand and get my balance. But most of the time, he put me in balance. He's so tuned to my way of riding that the communication between us, it's silent. It's blind. I can close my eyes. And I know that he'll take me where I want to be. And that's something that if you didn't feel that with a horse, that's a goal that you want to write down as a Christmas present. And you say maybe one day, you know, I get to the point with my horse that I can close my eyes and I just dream. I want to go here, I want to go there, I want to pick up the lope, I want to go down to the jug, I want to be collected, I want to be with engagement, I want to have impulsion beautiful words and every one of those nine or ten horsemen you ask what you're talking about is going to give you a different question different answer because those are just simple words what collection mean collection mean that you create magic it's nothing to do with the rain it's nothing to do with the hind leg it's nothing to do with the vertical it's nothing to do with the rounding of the back it means that you create something that you never forget. That's something that you're going to cherish for the rest of your life. Because it's a feel that comes only once in a lifetime. And when it comes, you try to keep it long as you can. Self-carriage, another one of those beautiful terms. Self-carriage, what that means? It means that the horse can carry himself for two strides without you bagging on it. So if you got two strides, you may be able to get three. But every fifth stride, you probably say, hey, buddy, let's come back and have a self-carriage again. So those are the things that you need to make sure that you and him have a contract, that he understand what you're talking about. When I pick up that train, OK? And light or not light is not the point. The point is that every time I pick up the train, I send a signal. And I have no idea what the signal is. Because every time I pick up the train, it's translated different. And the reason it's working for us, because it's a two-way connection. It's, always, it's almost like the internet. You know, now that you can ring that fast and it goes and come back and bounce right back to you, it's the same thing here. Now, when we're talking about light hand, light hand can pick up signals coming back from the bed or coming back from the hind leg or coming back from the round back. But you need to send the right signal to receive the right signal. So the rain really it's just a wire. 
it's a wire that transfer information between your hands to the bat and come back to you. And you need to grab it. Every time it's come back, you need to feel what you got back. If that's the right number or that's the wrong number. So when I pick up the train, he knows the phone is going to ring. And he's ready for it. He's waiting for it. Okay? Now, I want to go into a vertical. And never mind why. I want to go into a vertical. So, simple thing to do is just pick up the train, okay? Pick up the slack. You feel you got something there. And you let go of it. That's how you get into the vertical. And today works, tomorrow it doesn't work. Because tomorrow you probably need to add a little bit different aid to just that your hands, okay? So here I got my hand, and that's a Sunday, okay? Monday, I probably have to put a little bit leg on it, okay? And that's will put him in a vertical and send him forward. Okay, my name's Lynn Brown. I come from Kerry, which is in central Victoria, just north of Melbourne, in Australia. On the personal level, I found it very welcoming. The hospitality is superb. The weather's pretty good. Um, I think the presenters it's, are very professional, which I, it makes them easy to understand. Um, you get so many different things from the different people. I've um, enjoyed the whole range. I like their open-mindedness, especially, um, even though they obviously do things in different ways. They're very good at putting that message across to keep an open mind that there's something to learn from everybody. And um, I think it's great that they're here giving us all this information. Not only are these individuals professionals and trainers in their own right, but they are all students as well, committed to a lifelong process of learning and honing their skills, and then sharing them with other horsemen in the pursuit of total excellence in horsemanship. Visit the Light Hands Horsemanship website for announcements on the next symposium or always feel free to contact any of the individuals which participated in the event. They will be pleased to share their knowledge with you and help you achieve your goals and objectives for success in your relationship with your horse. Light Hands Horsemanship, a lifelong commitment to excellence in communication.